Anwar, you got it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'll try to speak up. Okay. Um, yeah. The thing is on. Okay. Uh, take it away. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the link between profitability and crises. But I want to take a detour, historical and analytical detour, through the work of Kondratiev. Because there's an interesting story in that detour, which uh, I, I find fascinating and it has some implications for the current uh, thing. I also want to mention that this material is from a book of mine which has been in the works a very long time and is now almost in the hands of Oxford. And so some of the themes uh, I've added a little bit to, to uh, refer to the current discussion today. But the main point of the book, and this is from the book, is that profit drives growth. Uh, both supply and demand, and this is an obvious point if we look at volume two of capitalist gain to reproduction, we see that the capitalist decision to uh, reproduce means to hire workers, which creates consumption demand, to, uh, to buy raw materials, which creates a demand for raw materials, to buy investment goods, so the profitability influences that decision, and that decision influences demand, at the same time, that decision to reproduce increase with supply. So the fact that they're both related uh, doesn't mean that they both match. And the whole point from the very beginning was to show in Marx uh, how uh, this relationship works. I want to just add that, in my opinion, it's extremely important that uh, there is a discussion in Stewart, which Marx comments on. Uh, about the two sources of profit. And the point, the comment that Marx makes, which is so relevant, I think, is that the source of profit on alienation, which he calls profit alienation, is really the source of profit under merchant capital. Because it's a profit coming from the circulation of products rather than the production of a surplus product. So Marx says, well, it belongs to the prehistory, but it'll become relevant when I come to the circulation. And of course, we know he managed to die before he got to that point. So uh, it's something, it's a clue, in my opinion, that's quite important. I believe it's also possible to develop from that a fairly uh, detailed and different account of uh, sources of the profit of finance capital. It's obvious that finance capital, insofar as it gets profit from lending and borrowing to uh, productive capital, is getting a source of surplus value. But finance capital can also make profit from lending and borrowing to the household sector, and it can do so in a very complicated way, which can be massive when the households so of the non capitalist uh, <coughs> part of the sphere of circulation uh, is spread across the globe. I bring this up because I'm not going to pursue it, but I think it's, it's relevant to some of the discussions today. Anyway, the key point in Marx and Keynes is the idea that the rate of accumulation is driven by the excess of the profit rate of the interest rate. And this is also important because Keynes calls this the difference between the marginal efficiency of capital and the interest rate. And Marx calls this difference profit of enterprise. And I'm going to look at the data on that because too much of the discussions of profitability fail to notice the importance of the interest rate in the discussion. Uh, just parenthetically, Marx and Herod both mentioned that accumulation expands both supply and demand, but only certain conditions permit balance. And Marx does it first for a two sector model. We know Herod does it for one sector. Their formulation is different because they're coming from different theories of where effective demand comes from. But it's a relevant historical thing because it can be relevant to modern discussion. Second point is that cyclical fluctuations are normal in capitalism. Uh, aggregate supply and demand uh, balances are achieved, in my opinion, through what we call the business cycle, the three to five year inventory cycle. Inventories, as you know, rise or fall because you're either building up your desired inventories or reducing them, but also because your unsold goods will add to inventories. And that part is, is simply an index of uh, excess supply or excess demand. There's also the relationship between capacity and demand, which is this fixed capital cycle. Again, this was referred to in the classical tradition, including Marx, as the business cycle. And of course, then we have also conjunctural shocks. The 
third point is that unemployment is normal in capitalism. And here, this is a very important distinction between Marx and, let's say, Keynes or, or much of orthodox economics is that the system maintains a normal rate of unemployment. That's not the same thing as the Keynesian argument that the system may be below full employment and can be pumped up. This argument is specifically that it has a tendency to reproduce a normal rate. And if, uh, though I can't do it here, an important, oops, important uh, argument in my book is that there's a very nice uh, inner connection between this argument and Friedman and Phelps's idea of the natural rate of unemployment, which has implications. I, by the way, it's mentioned in the book by a um, workshop called Keynes Hayek that Friedman started off as a socialist uh, and then became a Keynesian and then later switched to Hayek and from that became many did. And then Phelps, for instance, we know, was president at the conference where uh, uh, Goodwin first presented the Reserve Army of Labor paper, because before Phelps was on work on the subject. Why is relevant? If you're a socialist in New York, you may have read Marx, and you certainly, uh, many New York socialists did. And of course, Phelps was there when the Goodwin uh, presentation of normal rate of unemployment, so perhaps is in connection there. Anyway, crises are normal. And cycles are not crises. Crises are something that we might call great depressions. Um, but anyway, the history of the system re reveals these recurrent patterns. And in fact, they've been given different names to the historical event time. Of course, in the 1840s, we know that the 1848 crisis, when you know, Marx and Engels were out there trying to overthrow capitalism in the 1870s, the so-called long depression, a tremendous impact on Freud's life, for instance. Uh, 1930s, the Great Depression, 1970s, which I have long argued was a Great Depression, suppressed through the printing of fiat money and turning into uh, great stagflation, that is, uh, a slowdown in accumulation, in fact, a cessation of accumulation, along with inflation and business cycle, right, and business failures. And then, of course, the 2007, 2008, the beginning of the great great global crisis, which I call the first great depression of the 21st century. Then, this is just some pictures of, of capitalism which are familiar to an audience such as this, but this is a long-term uh, industrial production index. And the key point for me is that you not only see that growth is a normal part of the system, but you see that this growth has a lot of turbulence in it. This is a wonderful set of diagrams, uh, well, actually charts taken from Leonard Ayers, turning points in business cycles. And this is data maintained by the banks, because it was a great interest to the banks to know what the cycle was, because they were lending their money out, and they needed to know it's going to come back. So this is 1831. And you can see, I took out, uh, Ayers has for every cycle a name, like the rich man's panic of 18 something, but I took those out, it gets too crowded. But what I did keep was the labeling of these terms, uh, the crisis of or the Great Depression of 1840s. So What's so measured on the. the uh, well, that's a good question. The, he developed an index that was developed by a bank of deviations from what they consider the moving uh, center of gravity of output, but the bank doesn't explain it. They have a, they do what we modern uh, do. They take a bunch of indicators and try to find turning points and look at that data over that. Uh, and this is from 1867 to 1902. Again, you see this fluctuation, and you also see an event in the 1870s called the Great Depression. And then from 1903 to 1939, and of course, this is a familiar event again of the Great Depression. Now, what struck me when I was working on this and was that Kondratiev also uses the word crisis to refer to business cycles, which is the common use of it in the uh, 19th century. But he also distinguishes shorter cycles, three, three and a half, to, from seven to 11, and then what he calls uh, 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 major crises. His main point is that business cycles are normal, they're recurrent, they're organically inherent in the capital system. They are inherently nonlinear and turbulent. So this is a quote about that, the process of real dynamics is of a piece, it is not linear, does not take the form of 
polarizing line. To the contrary, it's moved with this irregular dispersive fluctuation. And that led him to consider another issue, which is longer movements, which he called long waves. And he believed that long waves were linked to depressions, which is my roundabout way of coming back to the issue of depressions. And this is a quote from him during periods of downward waves, long crisis eras of depression predominate, while during the period of rising waves, uh, long cycles eras of upstream that predominate. Now here is the equivalent, my modern equivalent of Kondratiev's chart. This is data taken from uh, uh, sources that have long-term uh, price indexes for England and the United States. These are PPI or WPI, uh, wholesale price indexes, and they are published sources. There's a book called The Golden Wave, I think it is, that has a lot of this data in it. And here's the UK, and this is the US. And you can see here a kind of Kondratiev waves uh, taking place. And if you smooth the data, it becomes very easy. You can take an HP filter. So you can see why Kondratiev got the sense that these were general across the center of the capitalist world. And yet, uh, Kondratiev's data, as we know, only goes until about the 1930s. And I think it was right valid up to the 1940s. And then, when you take the same data in the context of the present period, then you see that these cycles, which appear so big in the previous graph, are dwarfed by never-ending rising prices. <coughs> of course, this is the modern era of fiat money. There's no connection any longer to the gold standard, and states can print as much as they want, subject to whatever rules they set for themselves. And that suggests that the Gratian cycles are gone, except for the fact that in his own data, Kondratiev actually expresses the, side, the way, price waves in two forms, national currency and relative to what was the world currency at that time, the world standard, which is gold. But he puts the second set in a series of tables in the back, and he graphs the first one. Since that time, people have always looked at the graphs and not really at the data, because it's difficult to plot all that data and to enter it. Now we can do it. But even that entering the data points was not trivial. Um, so if you then ask yourself, what would the data have looked like had Kondratiev substituted his own appendix data for the primary one and written <coughs> and reversed it? And this is what it would have looked like. If he had done that instead, we would still be talking about Kondratiev waves, in my opinion, because you can see the US and the UK waves. These are U.S. and U.K. prices expressed in gold. And despite the manipulation of the gold price by governments over long periods of time and all of that, you can clearly see these patterns uh, here. And they come, you can see also these shaded areas in the downturns of the long wave, the economic crisis of 1815, the economic crisis of 1847, and the next downturn. Great Depression in this downturn, the Great Depression of 1873, 1894, the Great Depression of 1929, and then the stagflation, which comes in this downturn, and the economic crisis of 2007. I was so taken with this data that I used to show it in class starting around 2003, 2005. I began to smooth the data, and I used the previous two cycles to get an average idea of how long it takes to go from the peak to the bottom. And since by 2003, the smooth data had allowed me to find the peak around 2000. So I used to say, well, if that cycle continues on schedule, it will appear in 2008 and 2009. Um, and as we know, that was not. So what was on the vertical axis again? Uh, yes. The vertical axis is the, uh, let me go back one. These are uh, price indexes translated into gold. So these are gold price indexes. And this is the same thing, but smoothed by an HP filter, so that you can see the index movements. And uh, so all of these are index so numbers. the inverse of the price of gold. I'm sorry? It's the inverse of the price of gold. You can think of that as the inverse of the price of gold in each country, yes. It's the countries price converted to gold, but that makes it convertible to a common currency, so to speak. And that's the difference. 
Is it goods prices relative to gold prices? Is that, or is it just it's, 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 the, it's the WPI, the world uh, wholesale price index, divided by the price of gold. So it's ounces of gold per unit of, of uh, basket ones. Uh, this is actually much of this is in a book. I can call it gold away. So my point here is that um, that this I want to link this up now to the question of crisis because I want to ask why is it that this pattern recurs? And one answer from my point of view is that the one thing which has not changed over the history of capitalism is the dominance of the profit market, which is that drives accumulation and drives both demand and supply, modified by the state and the foreign factors and all of that, that remains central. So uh, on the surface, as many people have pointed out, the current crisis appears to be a crisis of excessive financialization, which implies that fixing the financial sector will prevent future crises. But I would argue this is not true because it fails to identify the real cause of the crisis. Now Keynesian and post-Keynesians share that argument that the real cause is not really in the finance sector, but in the, in, at least in the US, the cause is now inequality. That's why Kepi is so popular, because it fits well into the idea that inequality is the source of the crisis because it, it uh, arms aggregate demand. Um, so then they propose that you should link wages to productivity, so as to maintain a stable wage share, and use fiscal and monetary policy to maintain full employment. Uh, in my book, I spent a lot of time arguing against that on analytical and empirical grounds. But I want to return instead to the original argument, which is that if demand and supply are both regulated by profitability, it becomes kind of important to know how profit is doing. Just an antithetical comment, Piketty's data takes profit in the numerator, but it divides in the denominator by capital and financial assets and land. And that, in my opinion, is egregious and theoretically very weak double counting, because you're simply counting the circuit of the production of surplus value and the capitalization of surplus value is different from the capital that created surplus value, and then the capitalization of land and future rents and I know people don't read Morgan's Free of Marx, but really uh, that stuff is well known in the Marxist literature, and certainly in know for and people like that. Uh, so I'm going to now try to give you a very rapid run through of what my argument is. I would argue that the crisis was preceded by a long fall of the rate of profit. This is from a paper that was published in 2010 in uh, the Socialist Register, my paper. Uh, that the neoliberal attack on labor suppressed wage growth, reduced the wage share, and that this raised the profit rate and was a source of a boom. Quite contrary to the Keynesian argument that this would be the source of a lack of effective demand. Uh, the, in, the important thing is that the prop accumulation depends not only on the profit rate, but on the difference between the profit rate and the interest rate. And that turns out to be very crucial in explaining why a falling rate of profit was offset. These two factors, the reduction of wage share, which is an always a, a possibility for the capitalist class if they can bring it out, and a reduction in the interest rate, which is something recent in the era of fiat money, that the state can actually maintain an interest rate by creation of money. Uh, so, and of course, the question of the involuntary rate of unemployment. Now, uh, I would argue that what capitalism did, at least in the US in the post-war period, and I'm going to show you data, it's just worldwide, not just in the US. Interest rate was lowered tremendously. The profit rate was raised by lowering the wage share, raising the rate of surplus value, and that created a boom. But it also created the financialization that went along with the lower interest rate, and, and the bubble that went along with that uh, ultimately led to a point where either the unsustainable capital values had to be destroyed or uh, they had to be supported by the state. So I would argue this is the secret of neoliberalism, these two elements, and the secret of globalization, which is a search for cheap labor. I mean, made labor cheap in the country. In the US, uh, was not enough because labor is much cheaper abroad. And it's a secret of austerity economics. A lot of discussions in Europe make it seem as if Merkel is not smart enough to understand that uh, if you just pump up the economy and have aggregate demand pumped up, that you have full employment. I think she's smarter than that. I think she understands perfectly well that reduction of labor 
relative to productivity, raising the rate of surplus value is extremely good for capital. And if it does cause unemployment and the failure of a subset of capitals, that's normal. That's perfectly sensible. So this is the profit rate. The data, by the way, is in my original paper, but these are all data taken from the BEA or other official sources. You can see the profit rate falling here, and then this big boom, which I discuss in much more detail in the paper, which is the Vietnam War boom. There is a very important point. If accumulation depend on demand and supply, and both depend on profitability, you have to further add the fact that the demand part can be pumped up by the state, and that has an impact. It accelerates accumulation, but if it raises the wage share, it lowers profitability and has a limit in the effect on the profitability. And I'm, that have to be rather I'm, I'm honest, is this, is this the same as the net rate of profit on the previous slide? No, uh, I'm going to come to that in a minute. So this is the profit rate itself. And what my main point there is that here you see the stabilization. And this stabilization is due to this, which is the, this is the uh, productivity index, the dark line. And this is the real wage index, the, lo the lighter line. And you can see what happens when Reagan and Thatcher come into power, which is the, the two lines move together, wages uh, rise a little bit slower than productivity. But in any case, they many parallel movements in the so-called golden age of labor in the United States. But then you see the sharp divergence. The dotted line is the path that real wages would have taken had they not been sharply uh, reduced. In, you know, that's the straightforward extrapolation here. Uh, and this then tells me I can separate the path of the rate of profit, which is the dark line, and then here, and the kind of factual path of the rate of profit that would have happened had this not extraordinary intervention uh, in uh, rolling back the strength of labor or destroying labor unions in the United States and so on. Now I skipped over the second part of it, which is this graph. Well, anyway, let me just see if I put it elsewhere. It's, uh, somehow I could have a copy of it, but anyway. This is the right graph, but I, I wanted to show that there is a uh, parallel movement in the uh, interest rate of all US trading partners, OECD countries. In fact, all OECD countries. What I did is I calculated the three months rate for the US, which is the dark line. And you see that beginning in the same era, that uh, Reagan era, you get this tremendous drop in the interest rate. And the other graph, which I thought I put on here, was the OECD three-month rate. And that pretty much moves the same way. There's very little difference between the two, actually. Uh, individual countries, obviously, but the arbitrage links them together. So this is the key graph, then. Uh, I, I skipped over the profit of enterprise rate because I was concerned to show a, a different issue the rest of the data is in the paper, which is the mass of profit. Because I want to link it to an argument by Grossman that the crises occur when the mass of profit uh, stagnates. And that stagnation in the mass of profit of enterprise is the key variable. So here you see the mass of profit rising. It rises a lot. It doesn't look like it. But from 100 to 200, uh, more than 200 is quite a lot in 1947 to 67 period. Then you see this tremendous drop in the mass of profit of enterprise, real profit of enterprise, which takes place in the stagflation crisis. And here comes the cowboy, the recovery caused by the reduction of the interest rate and the raise in the rate of surplus value. And that causes a huge rise in the mass of profit, which peaks then and collapses in the current crisis. So now the question is, how is this linked, if at all, to uh, low rates? The argument in Grossman, which has been paid little attention to, is that the idea of a falling rate of profit translates into a crisis when the mass of profit begins to stagnate. And the simple reason for that is uh, actually he takes from Marx, which is that if capitalists invest and the mass of profit doesn't rise, then they have wasted a certain amount of their capital, which is they've added more capital without adding more profit as a class. And that means the weaker capitalists will be suffering losses, the stronger ones will be gains, and the systemic behavior will change, and you'll get a transition from uh, healthy accumulation to more abundant 
a week or two. She did roast my mace a lot on that point. Uh, I've written on this previously. So that leads the last question, uh, to the next question rather, which is how does this uh, manifest itself in the long ways? The long ways are price swings. How would the onset of a crisis uh, manifest itself in a price wave? And if you look at the gold price data in the periods, either when it's fixed or not, you will see a big recurrence to gold. If it, the price is fixed, the state is not able to maintain that <coughs> price in those periods. If it's variable, you see the price of gold shooting up. And so the wave that you're getting is because the price of gold begins to uh, manifest the occurring the, the coming crisis as bigger capitals and bigger own, uh, owners of money begin to seek a safe haven. And this happened in the 1980s and the 19, uh, the collapse of the Bretton Woods in the 1960s rather, and it happened again in the 2000s as the current crisis was coming to its fruition. What's unclear or needs to be worked on is why the long way is so uh, uh, bracketed in 40 to 50 years. I mean, if you play with the numbers for falling profitability and stagnating profitability and all that, you see that it's not terribly sensitive the long way to that. But still, it's an interesting question which hasn't been addressed. So, uh, this material is my way of trying to link up the idea that you can explain accumulation through profitability. You can locate in intrinsic tendencies. I skipped over, for instance, the, the falling output capital ratio, which uh, is present in the data because of time. But you can certainly do that. You can show the forces that operate on profitability. And I think there's something quite extraordinary about the 1980s in that the state acts not just on the attack on labor, but also on the reduction of the interest rate. So it acts on both sides, so to speak, to improve the profitability of capital. And that improvement is across the whole world because the lowered interest rate allows capital to flow across the world uh, and financialization is rooted in or at least greatly enhanced by the cheapness of the cost of capital. Um, I do a lot of empirical and theoretical work in the paper on this and all that, but uh, it's possible to, so my general argument in this book is that you can derive all the major observed patterns that we need as economists from downward sloping the bad curves, Engels' laws of elasticity and consumption functions, uh, and profit rate equalization, determination of relative prices, the theory of the interest rate, theory of exchange rates, and the theory of accumulation, including demand and supply, from a very simple set of principles, which is the impact of, of uh, basic movements were so crucial in, in uh, Smith, Ricardo, and Marx, which is the mobility of capital towards higher wages, the mobility of high profit rates, the mobility of labor towards higher wages, the mobility of financial capital to higher interest rates, and so on. Uh, and that you can then have a framework in which you do not need to import orthodox economics as your base. This is important because, and I want to end with this point, the FT has recently put out a call for new curriculum in economics. It says, and this is their um, editorial on September 25th, it's time for economics to get into the real world. It's time to stop playing with models. It's time to start dealing with alternate views, including, they say, uh, I believe it's Keynes Schumpeter, Schumpeter I remember for sure, Hayek, Hayek Schumpeter, and yes, this is their phrase, yes, even Karl Marx. <laughs> now this is a rare moment in history when the voice of the financial capital is saying that we should read more Marx. So I want to end with that. I think we should read Marx more seriously. <laughs>
Uh, maybe it means I should read the Financial Times more. Uh, uh, two points. Uh, uh, you, you talked about both the rate of profit and the mass of profit. Uh, the, uh, for the US economy, uh, most measures of the rate of profit show only a very uh, a brief and limited decline before the 08 uh, crisis began. And within two years, a bounce back to the previous pre-crisis high. Uh, uh, so, which seemed to make it not a very promising uh, uh, indicator of why the 08 crisis began. But uh, you had a graph of massive profits which showed a very big decrease from 05 to 07, which, which might explain it. I wondered, why, you know, what is, are you arguing that it is the massive profit that is the real indicator of a Great Depression coming rather than the rate of profit, and if so, why? And the second question is, why should we be concerned with the gold long waves and gold prices? What is the economic significance of that, and how, how is it related to movements in the real economy? Okay, these are great questions. Let me start by what seems like a uh, arcane point, but it's actually very important. Most people who look at the measures of profit rate do not realize that the uh, all national accounts in the advanced countries changed totally the way they measure capital beginning in the 1980s. And they did so by something called quality adjustment. Now what quality adjustment means is that you don't measure the stock of capital, you measure the quality embodied in the capital. And this is well known in the literature, but it's buried in the details of that. Robert Gordon, for instance, who my colleague David Gordon's brother, and very well known economist, makes the point that the measure of the uh, real capital is the amount of real profit that it will get. The national accounts have changed the way they measure capital precisely to accommodate that. And for that reason, if you take real profit and real capital, you'll find not much of a trend. They don't get a perfect balance because they don't have measures of profit, so they use output as a measure. But given that the profit share doesn't vary very much, the measure of real capital in modern accounts is correct when the output capital ratio is flat. That's the correct official measure. This is from Denison and Gordon and all the measures were changed. Now, it look, you don't notice that because, of course, they backdate the data to 1920. So you won't see that the capital stock measures have changed. So that's point number one. You cannot use real profit and real capital because they've been adjusted to be stable. Secondly, if you want to measure the profit rate, you have to actually measure them in the same units. And this is a point that Strafa makes. The price system that's applied to the surplus product must be the same as applied to the capital stock. Now, it turns out that a very simple way to do that, and they do it in national accounts, you can measure profit in nominal uh, amount, and then you have to measure capital in the current cost of reproduction. So uh, what I'm measuring is, in fact, Nominal profit divided by the reproduction cost of the capital stock. Now, I can divide both top and bottom by any price index. Now, I'll get a real rate. That's the whole point. That is Rafa's point. If it's measured properly, the real rate is the same as the, as the current rate. It's not nominal rate. It's the current rate. And that, for me, is a very important theoretical point, which I spent quite a bit of time on in the paper, because it's easy to show in the book that if you don't do it right, you will introduce an element which in the past was important, but now is absolutely decisive. So that's a, a short answer to... Uh, but what do you get when you do that, for the period right before oh, Well, the profit rate that I showed you was the nominal. Yeah. And uh, it, it didn't fall much before. No. Uh, this is it. Yeah. Actual corporate profit rate, right? Yeah. This is the actual corporate profit rate from... 1947. Right, so from just before the crisis, it only fell slightly. In fact, it didn't fall at all. Yes, indeed, that's the whole point. And the point is because I, I did, I skipped over the capital output ratio. I didn't know how much time I had, but it's in my 2000 paper in the Sources Register, 2010 paper. And I show that the capital output ratio actually rises substantially throughout. What's causing this is not that the capital output ratio pretty much follows this a trend going like that, but we'll just slow down a little bit here because accumulation slows down, but it stays rising steadily. What is causing this is a tremendous rise in the rate of surface value that takes place mm -hmm. in a possible period. And uh, that is, to me, a way of showing that the profit rate actually put a lot of pressure on the capitalist class to counter it. Uh, 
Um, there was lots of literature discussing that issue of why you need more wages and all of that. So I am skipping over a lot of the process. This data is the real amount of the profit of enterprise. It's the massive profit <coughs> uh, minus the interest rate equivalent on the massive profit, which is what how Marx defines the profit of enterprise, also how Keynes defines it. And uh, since it is not a ratio, I deflate it by the price index. In this case, the price index of capital, but it doesn't really matter. And that gives me the real massive profit of enterprise. Mm -hmm. But the two are obviously linked, but you need the profit <coughs> rate and the interest rate to derive this, and the inflation rate. But it tell a different story. Mm -hmm. I don't think it tells a different story, uh, because up here, here you have a, 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 a profit rate which has been pumped up, but and I didn't bother to do the sort of underlying normal profit rate, the reasonable business due to passive utilization. I didn't want to get into the discussion of how you identify that. But anyway, it would be easy to show the trend that this is going down here. And certainly in the period of the stagnation crisis, the profit rate falls sharply and steadily. Uh, so the point is, why does it change? It is precisely because of the, uh, interact, uh, the actions of capital and the state to change the path mm -hmm. of labor. So I think that's exactly uh, the kind of argument that you need to make when you're talking about tendencies and counter tendencies, but I don't mean whether the counter tendencies can do anything. This was a difficult and costly thing and had major implications. Moreover, it's limited. It's limited by the fact that interest rate uh, doesn't have a whole lot of room left to go by now. So two paths for a Taken. One is to lower the, the wage relative to productivity, and that reaches a certain limit. You can do it, obviously, that's, but you can't do it forever. And that also uh, reduction, reduction of the interest rate close to zero. And the third path is both the mobility of capital to cheap labor. And these historically have been always important. So if we're going to begin from profitability, we have to explain how profitability moves, and that includes the social and political uh, forces, so to speak. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, okay. John, now. Great point. Maybe there there was a second point about the price. Yeah, we need to slow it. We need to compress the answers then, or nobody else yeah. is going to get okay. on. Okay, my apology, but let me no, just quickly say, I think okay. I don't think we need to have long waves as a causal explanation, but it's a great indicator. And I think that's not trivial if you spend your life doing business cycle indicators. It's important to know something about it. John. Yeah. Um, one housekeeping point, and then a, a subsequent one. Um, spreadsheets uh, are, are uh, turn on with the publisher of established principle. Any um, empirical diagram or table must provide a spreadsheet that begins with the raw data and shows every adjustment made in order to get to the, uh, uh, to the, to the diagram. So if you just um, uh, uh, be sure. that, that's to avoid articles in which the people have, you know, wouldn't be in your case, but have tables taken from someplace else uh, and, uh, and reproduced. Uh, and um, uh, so everything has to, somebody needs to be able to reproduce it. Piketty may have committed many sins, but one thing is good on with that. Now on my substantive point, I think. Um, I'd be a little careful commenting on um, what happens in Europe, like the Merkel point. First of all, real wages are not down in Germany. They weren't repressed, they were flattened. I'm not talking about Germany, yeah. I'm talking about Europe. Yeah. But you're missing no, Merkel. I mean about her position about Greece okay. and okay. France. Well, there are many people Spain. that disagree with it, and they shouldn't be labeled Keynesians. There is a, what I would consider, a, Marxian point that asks the question, why isn't a strategy of raising surplus value relatively being followed? And frequently the argument is that, and it's made by a number of people, is that changes in the tax laws and uh, other regulations of businesses have resulted in the shift of profits to distribution uh, to uh, shareholders and salaries and so on, Simon uh, uh, talked about. And as a result of that, 
the investment rates are down all over Europe, which is true, they're down in Germany, they're down everywhere, down in Britain. And that <clears throat> when you lower the investment rate and the rate of technical change slows down, the only way to raise profits is to raise uh, absolutely. So whether you believe that or not, I think uh, one has to at least give a nod to that as a uh, serious argument. Uh, Amar? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the reminder about spreadsheets. I forgot to mention that my book has 200 pages of appendices with spreadsheets. Yeah. Well, we wanted an Excel sheet. Well, they are Excel sheets, as a matter of fact, and uh, Oxford will require me to put them on the web because if they don't fit the point in a book, because then you can't get them, so they'll be available. But I could hardly do that. No, no, it Most but, people haven't done it for this. For anyway, my 2010 paper, the data is there, and I say it's available to anybody in the class, and it's been reproduced by the class. Um, why is not relative surplus value there? And I would argue that, of course, <coughs> Germany is a prime example of development of productivity of labor, high productive labor, maintenance of, of relative surplus value. But in a crisis, it is a tremendous advantage to reset the capital labor relation. And it is not a mistake, in my understanding of what's in the interest of capital, to have wages lowered. It's, in fact, a great benefit. Yes, it may cause uh, depression and unemployment, and yet there may be political in this and that, and perhaps a contagion will sweep over even the bigger capitals. But I think they're actually doing the right thing. Now, I haven't seen the Marxists who argue that uh, this position, so I'll try to bring that up. But certainly Keynes has been arguing the opposite, which is that you should raise wages, because then this will make everybody happy. The capitalists will get more demand, workers will get more jobs. Yeah, but nobody's arguing that. No, well, I don't know the model. Any, any changes do argue that, as a matter of fact. No, but nobody in this room is arguing. Oh, that's possible. Yes, that's possible. But it occurred to me that other people may see this in some form. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Simon? And then we have Oscar and Ben at this point. Um, yeah, it's, it's a quite a simple question, I think. I think you, you showed us three pictures. One of the rates of interest, one of the profit, rates of profit, and one of the mass of profits corrected for interest. Is, is that, that right? But there isn't actually a, you didn't show us actually a picture of the net rate of profit. Am I, am I right? I did not. It's in my paper. And I okay. was afraid that I would run out of time, but I can certainly produce it. I can add it to this and so this. What I, there's one thing I don't really understand. You say the rate of accumulation is driven by the difference between the rate of profit and the rate of interest, which I think you call the net rate of profit. And let's suppose the net rate of profit last year was 5% and this year is 2%. And next year is 1%, suppose. It still seems to me more profitable to produce than not. To get 1% is better than nothing, isn't it? How, what precisely is the connection between the rate of accumulation and the net rate of profit? Uh, yes, shall I answer that? Or, yeah, 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 please. First of all, the idea of the net rate of profit is not mine. Uh, as I say, it's very old in the literature and business literature, it's in Keynes, and especially emphasized at length in Marx. And the reason is very simple because in knowing whether the risky uh, process of throwing your capital into circulation with the hope of getting it back, MCM prime, one uh, measure of, of your success is whether you do any better than if you left it in the bank. And that is why it becomes an opportunity cost. It's not actually that you pay that, because it's, it's, a, it's a benchmark cost. And Marx goes on, I would say, in about hundreds of pages, at least 100 pages on this point. And I think it's absolutely correct. Uh, so then the question arises, what's the significance of any rate of profit, net or not? If it is positive, why not keep accumulating? And the answer is that the rate of profit is a measure of the average. All capital exists as a distribution. What happens, and you can observe this by more detailed data by looking at profitability by firm, is that as the profit rate falls, a greater portion of capital is underwater. And a sufficient portion goes underwater, the feedback effects of those closures and unemployment, and they'll come back on the other capitalists too. And that 
accounts for the things change part of the story. Now, again, I went through that very fast, but uh, the book is very long and has a lot of detail about that kind of thing. So I, I think that the broad answer is that if every capital received identically the same rate of profit, big or small or so on, then you know, perhaps they would just choose according to whether they feel the future is uncertain. And they still, might, some of them might close down because there is still a lot. A profit rate doesn't guarantee another profit. But in point of fact, that is added on to the fact that many capitals are already undergone and even in the best of times. In the book, I mentioned that something like 20% of capital started in a good year. Maybe it's even a higher number than 20%, maybe 40% fail within a couple of years. So that the idea of an average rate of profit is not the same thing as saying everybody gets it. And if the rate of profit falls, the percentage of the failures goes up sharply. And I skip that data, but you can see that very short, very clear. Uh, yes, uh, I have nine questions. Ah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I was just doing it for John. I mean. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, I have a bunch of questions actually, but uh, the simple one is to sort of like tie with the other presentations as well. Uh, in your argument, I, th I mean, it seems like you're arguing that there is a slowdown in the rate of accumulation due to the decline in the profit rate which kind of like David was yesterday saying that there's a decline in the accumulation because demand fell. Uh, demand was like already sort of like, uh, you know, leading to over accumulation. And then Jan was talking about like why non-financial corporations, uh, how they had like financial problems in the financial markets and how they, so, so I'm kind of like curious about like the, uh, the mechanism that, uh, that follows the, uh, this because I was actually just looking at the rate of profit in your 2010 paper as well, and it seems like, okay, the rate of profit uh, starts falling just a little bit right before 2007 in your graph. Uh, it quickly re recovers, it starts like going up in 2008, for example. Uh, so what is the actual mechanism that's, that's actually taking place there? That's, that's my first question. And my second question is the question that David sort of asked as well, how do we interpret those movements of gold, uh, gold price, uh, in your long ways? Because when you look at those Great Depressions, in some of them, uh, well, in one of them, uh, you see the decline going on together with the depression. It's kind of like simultaneous. In one of them, it just there's a sharp decline, and then the sort of uh, depression takes place. So it's like, what is going on there? Like, what is the economic logic, or what is the, what is your explanation there? I'll save the other seven questions Let me for do that. the first one first, which is that I actually argue that the rate of profit, the net rate of profit rises. That's the whole point. And I apologize, I should have put that graph in there. Uh, I did that just as people were talking. But anyway, what happens here, if you, if you look at this graph, you see that the net rate of profit actually falls pretty steadily because up here the interest rate is rising, so that counters it. And, uh, and here it falls even faster because up here the interest rate is rising, but here the interest rate is falling and this flat trend is transformed into a sharply rising one. And I argue in the book that that is the source of the great neoliberal boom. It's the transformation of the profitability of capital. And because the interest rate falls all over the world, by implication, uh, all major capitals get this benefit at least. They may not have had a rise uh, in the rate of surplus value, but they certainly get the benefit of the uh, fall in the interest rate. And But the trouble is that the, that is a boom that has a limit. It has a limit in the fact that the interest rate cannot fall any longer, and it has another limit in the fact that that process of keeping alive all of those capitals built up, and many of them are, even by Wall Street terminology, zombie capitals are not allowed to die. And as they're not allowed to die, the necessary uh, concentration and centralization and getting rid of debt work doesn't happen. Japan is an example of exactly what happens if you can keep these capitals alive, which is that you don't have a sharp fall, you don't get a depression, but you also don't have the sharp rise that you got in the U.S. and in, in uh, England, for instance. So this, uh, <coughs> I skip over that. So the, then the question is, I think that the gold price movement is not causal. It's symptomatic. Uh, the data, you can certainly see gold price movements. Go back here, sorry. 
you can see these concrete movements are very related to events such as wars. And, uh, but if you smooth the data, you see rather remarkable patterns which are quite different. Now, here's a problem which I haven't been able to solve. Ideally, if you want to look at this price movement, you want to take out the effect of state intervention. Because in, in, uh, data in the book, which I didn't show here, you see there appears to be low prices constant because of state intervention. Why does it not keep it constant? Because there's a run on gold, and they have reserve decline, and they let it go. And usually in times of crisis or war or so on. It would be great if someone would have more cut metrics than I do with the gold and gold price index. There's data going back to 1560 or whatever. And work out a simple econometric estimate of what the market price of gold would have been without state intervention. And it's a project that very students could do. Uh, and that would give us a way of getting these measures without taking the actual gold price when it's flat, but some kind of proxy for the market price. And I bet you'll find these will be much more regular than the other ones. Okay. Uh, ben, and then I have David Harvey, and then myself. Uh, this is not a comment on analyzed paper, it's just gratuitous. <laughs> in light of some of the discussion, it's a comment of observation about Germany, which may be wrong. Um, but it's my understanding that um, wage increases in the successful export industries in Germany are at least keeping pace with productivity. So how is it possible then that there's real wage uh, suppression or stagnation or whatever, and the answer is, of course, there are those workers who are not in the, those successful export sectors, plus uh, this dependence of those export sectors on production networks extending into Eastern Europe where low wages are very, very much greater. Um, so I think one has to be very, very careful about placing explanations of, of Germany's position on the idea of productivity outstripping wage increases and this creating uh, export uh, competition for uh, the rest of Europe or whatever. But the bigger lesson, one, one which I made at the, the very beginning, is it's also important to look at disaggregated evidence. So and I suppose the lesson for Anwar might be, please tell us which of these sectors to which your analysis applies. Is it steel, is it coal, is it cars, etc. Um, did you That's why we have brand new students. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just briefly say sure. that I, I did not argue that this took place in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, but an important point about Germany, which I would argue, is that Germany is competitive. <coughs> not only in the EU, but competitive on the world scale because it produces goods of its quality at a cost that it can maintain in the world market. And so the important point is not just wages and productivity, how they move together, but where their costs are, their absolute costs, uh, relative to other competing products. And that cannot be done from the next time. You really need, that's why I made the point about GPP for hours of is that we cannot tell from rising unit labor costs whether they are rising but below those of competitors or they are rising and above. And that's a rather important difference in the theory of free trade to which I subscribe. David. Yeah, I have a couple of questions there. First, um, I and mean, then all the stuff is fascinating, but I wonder what's happening to the physical economy uh, in the middle of it all. And one of my favorite books is uh, Bruno Thomas, which is about the Atlantic economy, and what Atlantic, well, he describes uh, countervailing investment movements and housing construction between Britain and the United States. There's a boom in housing construction in the United States while it's depressed in, in, in Britain. And then it seems like capital got tired of that and probably got back to Britain to like a boom in Britain. And, you know, I mean, in other words, there are these swings, which are long swings in urban development, which are about 18 to 20 years, as opposed to the congratulations you we're talking about. But it seems none of that shows up. And I wondered if the reason wasn't that uh, by concentrating on 
just the price mechanism, uh, and in particular attaching it to gold, so there's this whole kind of problem, what's the relationship between commodity prices and the gold prices, and are there independent movements of the gold prices that are reflected here as opposed to what's, you know, so there's a, a it seems to me a bit of a, a, a problem. Uh, and finally, uh, you, you started out by kind of saying there's two sources of profits. One of them is what you call profit from alienation, which I call accumulation by dispossession. And, uh, you know, how much of that is going on in this whole system? I mean, like Marx, you kind of said, you promised to talk about it, but in the same way that he never got back to it, uh, then, uh, you know, what, what's the role of, of that in all of this? Okay. Um... I, I'm not sure I quite understood the issue about housing construction. I mean, uh, the real economy, but I, I agree that if one wants to make an analysis of the sort that I'm making, starting at the top, we want to zoom in to show how it's manifested. And I didn't do that. I haven't tried to do that. But I do believe that the average rate reflects something really fundamental about accumulation. And what I do do in the book is to try to link the rate of accumulation to these factors. I didn't get into that here, uh, to show how it shows up as an unemployment, which is more concrete than this, and uh, the effect of unemployment on the wage share and all of that, but I skipped that over here. I, I hope you didn't misunderstand my reference to gold. I'm not arguing that the currency should be related to gold or was regulated by gold. Gold here is a, a currency, it is, a, is an asset of escape in times of crisis, and I am not person who invented that terminology, it's a very popular uh, in financial markets that when you have a crisis, you want to get out of the local currency. Well, what's the local currency in the U.S.? It's the U.S. currency. So you go abroad, you go to yen, but that's not in very good shape either. You can go to the euro, that's not in good shape. And not many people are investing in the RMB, so gold becomes a source of a, a safe haven. And that's been true always. Uh, it's a, it's a privileged safe haven, but it's not in itself the only safe haven. But I was interested in the fact that Gratia has these prices using gold and common currency and uh, local currency, and the patterns are entirely different, and I think that's something worth looking at. The question of profit and alienation, uh, I believe that that has an enormous role from the explanation of profit in Marx's own work, let alone in the empirical. And there's no way I could address that here. But uh, one of the things it explains is the enormous profits that can quickly be made by uh, selling stocks and bonds. If you're getting that money not from other capital, but from uh, uh, institutions that are responsible for recirculating uh, uh, savings of households, including households themselves, but obviously big. Uh, insurance companies, my money, all my savings as an academic is in something called TIA CREF. I don't know what it stands for, but it has all my money and it does whatever it feels like within the broad limits, including buying all these things. So, and that's a transfer. That's a transfer from my savings. Uh, Marx's comment on it is that it is very important for understanding pre-industrial capital. And he goes on to say, I am not dealing with it now because I explicitly wish to exclude this in order to emphasize what he calls profit on production or profit on surplus value. And I will come back to the significance of this later, where it shows up as a material rent. And that part is much less known, known in the Marxist literature and very fragmented in volume three capital. But you can see these transfers that take place uh, there. I think it is very important to explaining the modern phenomena of huge capitalization of revenues. But not all the revenues are coming out of profit, and that's a key point. How one could estimate that empirically, I don't know. I would come back and I was just talking about this. If you're people interested in doing this, perhaps we can do this as an extension of the creative surface value argument. Capital gains plays a very important role in this aspect, by the way. And uh, profit as we measure national accounts, does not include capital gains. But you can go to full funds accounts, which takes that capital profit and adds to it these other sources, including capital gains, and perhaps the difference between the two would be something there. But uh, I haven't done it, and uh, I hope not to have to do it.
Oh, uh, Simon, you want to go? How about after that? Me? No, yeah. after me, there is. Well, depends on how long I go, I guess. Um, yeah, real quickly, I just wanted to ask you something about the interest rate, you know, which you said was left out uh, a lot, certainly in considerations of property. And very quickly, first of all, I just want to ask, I assume you use the actual profit rate in money terms and then compare that to the nominal interest rate. That's, that's what you did. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, so the, the, two, the two quick questions are, um, I mean, you indicated that in the 1980s, the, the, the boom that sort of, the, the thing that took off in the 1980s was because they, the, they pushed the interest rate down. So uh, the question is, what determines the interest rate? Are you just saying this is exogenous, that this is policy determined, that they can determine it, uh, they can push it wherever they want? And if that's so, why didn't they push it down in the 1970s when they had this long fall that certainly was disturbing? Why did they wait until the 1980s? And then related that sort of the same thing, it would be now, um, there's an awful lot of voices both in the United States and in Europe that are calling for a rise uh, in the interest rate. It doesn't seem to me that capitalism is doing so fantastically well that if it's this size of this gap that's going to make it do well, that the capitalist interest should be calling for a rise in the interest rate. Why would you say, I mean, other than maybe you think they're stupid, but why do you, why would they be calling for a rise in the interest rate? Okay, uh, again, I keep, I apologize, I keep referring to this whole thing. Sure, I understand, I understand. I, understand. Yeah. I just finished it. Yeah. Um, I have on this here a graph for a reason, which is the relationship between the nominal interest rate and the price level. I pick the price level of capital goods because I generally do that rather than CPI. Mm -hmm. But the reason for that is different. Part of my argument in the book is that in order to know whether the interest rate is deviating from its market rate, you have to have a theory of the market rate. And I develop an argument which uh, is in fragmentary form in Marx and Mill and others, and but again is obscure because he has more than one position on this which is that if you think of the interest rate as the price of financial provision, what a bank charges you for the money it lends you, then following up on argument actually made by Marx that the banks are subject to profit rate equalization, it's easy to show that then the interest rate will be subject to profit rate equalization. And if it does, it's determined in a particular way. And that determination has the following implication. It depends on the profit rate and on the cost of financing, which is uh, assets, physical assets and all that. And in, the, in the Sarafa sense, you can write that relation. I showed that it's very strong empirically, provides an alternate theory of the interest rate, but it also implies that the interest rate moves with the price level. That because the costs rise, and if the profit rate is otherwise moving in a small way, the price level is going to dominate the interest rate. And that's why I have this picture here, because this is the price level and this is the interest rate. And then what happens in, the, in this era where Reagan comes in and post Reagan is that the price level goes here and the interest rate goes the other way. And so the question is, why this divergence? Why did it actually goes back to 1790? I want to bring that in now. You can see this broad parallel, and that's known in the orthodox literature as Gibson's paradox. The reason it's called a paradox is because the Fisher theory of real interest rates says that the interest rate will follow the inflation rate. And what Gibson found, which Took found, which Marx remarks on, is that the interest rate follows the price level. So I want to show why. Having shown why, I can show that it does. And then this raises the question, why not? One answer could be that these are big capital flows into the U.S., but I think the answer is simpler. We know from policy discussion, we know from the amount of money state spends on intervening to hold interest rates down, that this is a largely, but entirely, a policy movement. And the graph that I thought I had put and skipped over, didn't say take, was the profit rate and the interest rate in OECD countries, which follows the same pattern. Now, if that's so, then the interesting question that you raise is why didn't they do this before? And the answer is that they really had to intervene in the free market in a way that uh, they could not have done until they got a conservative government in power. Uh, if this had been done in, in uh, uh, Carter's time, Carter allowed the interest rate to rise because he was told from standard models that's the right thing to do, the cost of the election, as he 
put it out. He agreed to let Prince, uh, uh, what's his name, do it? Volker. Volker. Volker do it. And um, he said, I know it's going to hurt and it actually costs him the election. None of these guys were interested in doing it. They were interested in manipulating the system to bring out the best results, and now they have the power to do it. And there's documents from their own discussions about the intervention. Uh, Greenspan says, I had no idea this was going to have these consequences. But he said he was starting to do it. So I, I don't know why they didn't think of it before, but certainly they thought of it now. And if they let it go, remember there are sectors who lose from the interest rate being low. Mm -hmm. Anything that depends on income from assets like, is screwed. And there is a pressure, therefore, to let the interest rate come up to a reasonable level. But that's going to hurt all these zombie capitals who are so far able to block it. So uh, where it's going to go, I don't know. Simon? Yeah, um, I have a, a, a pretty trivial comment and then a question. The trivial comment relates to your smooth diagram. Can you just put it on the one? The, the one that you've done the smoothing, the filter smoothing. one. Yeah. I don't use it for anything except to make a point that this is what I was doing in classes. But it is kind of interesting that it works. Well, yeah, it is interesting that it works. But the problem with filtering is that you can get any result you want by appropriate choice of filter and to choose a smoothing parameter of 100, most economists would say you've over-smoothed the data. But the, the, I, know, I know 100 is the default value on programs like eViews, but the uh, Morton Raven showed that, Spawn Raven and Irving, something, something like that, showed that actually if the smoothing parameter for quarterly data is 1,600, then for annual data it ought to be six and a quarter and not 100. And that will make a difference to what it looks like. The other thing is, yeah, does, actually, in terms yeah, of right, exposition, yeah, yeah, is right, yeah, yeah. Podrick Prescott is known to be unreliable at the endpoints. So you might be better fitting at Cleveland nearest neighbor uh, local pressure. <coughs> I did like that, that, and I mentioned it in the book, but I didn't do that here. Anyway, yeah. that's, that's, that's just... But my question is, you, you went, it was about your answer to my previous question, when you said the distribution of profit rates was important in, in thinking about the underlying metrics. I just wanted to ask you whether you've got information in your book about the shape of that distribution. Is it normal? Is it log normal? Is it Pareto? What is the shape of the distribution of profit rates and how big are the tails? Um, I do. Uh, I have a data set with, I think, 335,000 firms. Uh, and we, after cleaning it up, because some of them report negative capital value and stuff like that, they're not they're required to report everything. They can make up any numbers at all. But after cleaning it up, we still have a pretty large sample, I think 100 and some thousand. And we look at the distribution of, of, yeah. of many variables, uh, including the relationship between capital size capital intensity, that is capital output, uh, profitability, and so on. We find some many interesting patterns. One is that the distributions are highly skewed. They are, if you cut off at a positive number, you get a, a kind of concentration up here and then a long tail. Uh, uh, and they're uh, I'm working with the Senate graduate students who are actually looking at the properties of these distributions. Uh, and they find that they show up again in year and year. It's, I forgot the name of the distribution, but it's a particular asymmetric distribution. There's quite a bit of discussion in the economic physics literature about profit rate distributions and their theoretical properties. It's a very interesting subject. I don't have much more to say on it, except that I know that it is stable, which is quite striking, and I know the answer to that. Uh, the second thing I found, which is very interesting, is that in the business literature, it's taken for granted that the higher the capital size relative to output, the lower the profit rate. And in this data, I found that also to be true, but I found something else which is quite interesting and striking. The variance of profit rates by asset size, so by asset size, diminishes as you get to bigger assets. And there is actually an article by a man named Dawan who presents this data, and you can roughly see that the profit rate falls as you go to bigger capitals. Remember now, these are all in different industries all mixed together. So you only have size, you don't have <coughs> industry. The profit rate distinctly and clearly falls as you go 
higher in organic composition of carbon. But the variance decreases, and roughly speaking, if you take the variance as an index of risk, the rate of profit uh, falls, but much less when you adjust for risk. In other words, bigger capitals have smaller profit rates, but they have much smaller risk. The risk is very high at the bottom. Uh, death rate is extremely high. So we're looking at survivor patterns and all of that. Uh, and, you know, that's not so different from uh, uh, comment you can find in the classical literature about uh, individual capitals. Uh, and I agree that we need to look from the aggregate down to the concrete. I've also been looking at distribution of wages for the reasons we were talking about earlier, and distribution of profit and income for any kind of stuff. So all of these things, in my opinion, can be put together without relying anywhere on your classical theory, even as a source of something that you in effect, or what I call uh, apply enhanced interrogation. Okay, we got just time to put it out and uh, maybe answer, maybe not. Okay, uh, first point is uh, uh, keep my book in mind. Uh, please minimize any reference to your other work that would actually require someone to go pick it up and read it to believe what you say. Mm -hmm. We want a freestanding book. Um, and so one way to do that is for each of us to limit what we uh, have to say to a clear, narrow point uh, in which we can explain almost everything in the article itself uh, that people need to know. So I'll put out that plea uh, to all the authors. Uh, uh, the other point is that um, the, uh, we've had at least two papers on financialization in which it has been stressed that particularly in the U.S. economy that the firms that uh, receive interest are the same firms that receive profit and enterprise. So I think at some time, point in your paper, you need to um, deal, with that, uh, deal with that issue because uh, an obvious question that would arise, not necessarily an obvious question is, um, what, but don't, are not all the same firms getting both the interest uh, and profit and enterprise? So if you could, that, that would link then to uh, other papers in the book. Did you want to say something quickly to answer? Very quickly. Um, I, I don't know what that was aimed at. The book was a paper for the conference. You mean the paper for the conference? Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can do that, to be honest, because you see I'm covering a lot of ground. I, I would try, I could put all the data in such a form that then it might be to me. Uh, I personally don't believe in writing papers on small narrow subjects. Uh, they don't interest me, because there's no way to put them in context without relating them to something else. So I would be happy to draw a paper. I will send it to you and you tell me whether it's feasible or not. But the argument I'm making is to try to show this in a bigger context. That's the thing that interests me, not the actual thing itself. Okay, so I think we'll end today's session on that nice note of uh, <laughs> different views of how to proceed. Thank you very much.